thank you, Hal Lambos, for having me. Uh, a few words about me. Um, I'm 36 years old, going 37. I have one wife and one son. <laughs> okay, I, I, I am business background. I'm a graduate of the University of Cyprus in 2004. And then I went to uh, Cardiff University in Wales for my master degree. I have experience in B2B um, mostly, uh, and I have worked with early stage startups as part of of the university incubator and. Uh, and the Center for Entrepreneurship, which I helped establish uh, almost three years ago now. Uh, currently, I'm the executive director of uh, Youth Board of, of Cyprus. It's a government, uh, governmental agency. We are the counselor of the state on youth. So we produce policy, and we also have programs and activities, hol a holistic approach towards youth. I, consider, I still consider myself as an entrepreneurship enabler. So uh, I have helped create conditions here at the university, and now I'm also, I'm also trying to do it at the youth board for people to do things in, uh, uh, in the entrepreneurship sphere. Uh, I also uh, assist at my family business. Uh, it has to do with uh, construction, waterproofing, but it, it really helps me stay in touch with the market and how the market works. So everything in theory goes into practice uh, there. And I also play basketball. Uh, on the agenda of this presentation, because I have a second one after this, as I said, it will be um, some notes I took from the technology transfer con uh, conference in Zurich. And I will talk a little bit more about the new emphasis point I took away from all the speakers. So um, I saw a lot of technology transfer offices. They presented, I mean, like 12, 12 of them. The one that. Uh, impressed me the most was the home one. So uh, ETH at the hub, have you visited? You want to visit? It's a majestic building, uh, amazing university. Of course, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of resources, but uh, they are doing, I, I believe they are doing an amazing job. And it's a good uh, example of what we could aim on doing. Of course, it reminds me a little bit about the story about uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurship hubs. Everyone is talking about Tel Aviv, the startup nation, and so on. And uh, many people do the mistake trying to imitate something that they are not able to. And of course, uh, Ete Heights years ahead of us, probably years ahead of you as well. So it's not something that will be easily copied, but it's, it's good to know uh, like a best practice example, maybe not uh, in the short term, but in the long term uh, of your activities as well. So, uh, their uh, motto is making Edehas technologies available for the benefit of society. So, they are aiming at taking technology from the labs for the benefit of the society. And I took that down because their main, is, their main goal is not to make money for the university, but to benefit the society. So they are aiming at that. And it's really important to have you know, a starting point and knowing what are you aiming to. Uh, at. Are you aiming at making money or are you aiming assisting actually the society, benefiting from uh, what is going on in the labs? So they have four major um, departments, let's say. They have research agreements and they provide services to the EDH researchers in drafting, reviewing, and negotiating agreements. They have a patents and licenses uh, department, and they evaluate, they protect, and they out-license uh, technologies from the university. Uh, they support spin-offs coming out of the, of the universities, and they also have an innovation and entrepreneurship lab. Uh, it's like an incubator at, uh, at the end of the half. And of course, they have lots of people there. Uh, you are one. You are more than, more than one, but still not. <laughs> This way. And, uh, and we are also 0 0.5 probably. <laughs> so um, they have uh, quite a few very experienced staff in, uh, in their fields and they have 30 coaches. And this is a very important point as well. You will have your staff at the university, but it's a good idea to develop a network of coaches of maybe um, uh, they're not getting paid, of course, they're uh, volunteers. So it's a good idea to have a volunteers network 
uh, a mentors list. Uh, we have started one here at the university. We have around 25 uh, people that are willing to help at different stages of the technology transfer process. So we have people that are really, really experienced. They started something and they finished something, so they know the whole cycle. But we also have even undergrad students that they have started something in order to promote entrepreneurship in young students. They can easily identify themselves into them. So having a good and uh, a, a, a good variety of coaches and mentors at your offices, I think would be a good idea. Um, this is a sample of their, I mean, this is an indication of, of their work. Uh, in 2015, they had around 900 uh, research agreements coming out of, of uh, the university, and of course different kinds, by a good number of, of research agreements. Because at the end of the day, it's uh, a numbers game as many agreements and grants and um, consortium agreements and, and so on you have, the, the most probably is that you will do something important at the end of the day. Now, at the patenting and uh, licensing of, uh, of IP, as I said, they do evaluation, they do advice, but patentability, so they talk to researchers, research, researchers come forward with their ideas and they they ask for advice, uh, they do the patent application, and so on. Um, I was really amazed that they also do the production of marketing material of, of patents and, and, and licenses. Um, they identify industry partners and uh, uh, some, some uh, partners in uh, getting licenses and so on. And they also control and distribute the revenues. So you have to, you know, well with them because they control the money. The way they, it's, it's what up. is this uh, licensing that tech alerts? Yeah, they you know they talk with people. They have these networks with the industry and other researchers. And when they have like uh, an alert of technology related to some of the patents uh, that could affect even uh, how the patent will. Uh, um, go to the market or, uh, or how the, maybe the procedure will also be infringed by some other technology. They notify the researchers, okay, that you have a new um, uh, danger coming your way or you compare it or maybe at the end of the day, something similar. So it's not something that they look into the market and they notify the, the researchers of possible risks they may face in the procedure of going to the market. Uh, now, a, a a question that arises during their presentation is how do you motivate uh, researchers to come forward with their uh, ideas and, and, and results? Uh, well, they try to educate uh, researchers uh, that if you come forward with a patent, it's something good for your CV, it, it builds your reputation. Uh, at the end of the day, you will have products on the shelf with your technology inside, so it's something to build up your prestige. Uh, you will help create employment and, and income not only for yourself, that is a personal financial incentive. One third of the net revenues goes to inventor or inventors or uh, to the team. And, uh, and also potential participation in a prestigious award they have there. They call it the Spark, the Spark Award. Uh, I will show you some uh, slides afterwards on that. I think it's also a very good idea to have an award. And it's also fun to do. So this is the way they try and motivate researchers to go come forward with their uh, ideas. And, and how do they get noticed? Uh, they don't do, it's mostly direct disclosure to them. They don't do you know, an active scouting uh, procedure. They don't uh, you know, actively look for themselves. Most of the researchers come forward. And, uh, but in order to do that, we noted that the scientists, the inventors, have to be aware of the commercialization procedure. Uh, so they have to be aware of who to contact and when, it's very important, before they disclose anything to anyone at the conference, in the paper, and so on. Uh, so it's very important to understand confidentiality of technology transfer. Maybe for some people working with technology transfer of, or uh, have worked at the, at the past, this is something very, you know, logical. But for many researchers, this is not. So you have to be aware that they understand. 
So people have to know what technology transfer is. And this is the point where the university comes in and needs to allow technology transfer officers to communicate their job and the importance of their job to the community of the, of the university. In a different uh, scenario, uh, many problems could arise and, uh, and they themselves will find these problems uh, ahead. Uh, who do they target? Uh, it was another part of the discussion. Uh, how wide is your target group at the, at the university? They are so big, I mean the team is so big, but they still mostly target at researchers. So professors, postdocs, and PhD students. Uh, students are not in the primary focus. So if someone that is in the student community of the university comes forward and he's a possible founder, of a spin-off maybe, or, in a, or, or a startup company, okay, they will give him some attention, but they don't actively look for students. They mostly uh, target the researchers. Also, a, a very important uh, uh, procedure, uh, procedure activity they do is IP awareness. Uh, as I said, it's very important for uh, researchers to be aware of the whole process so they don't make any mistakes that will cost them a, maybe a patent, a spin-off revenue at the end of the day. So they do uh, seminars, uh, seminar talks in research groups, uh, specifically accessible after a bad experience. Uh, uh, we ask them, okay, it's not for us at least at the university, so it's not always very easy to go to a research center and be accepted in you know, having some time in their very busy schedule to present something on IP. And they said, this is the case for us as well. It's the same all over the, the world. But it's more easy to go after they had a bad experience. So after they had uh, a disastrous experience with, uh, with IP because they didn't know what to do and so on, it's very easy for you to go in and say, okay, let me explain a few things about, some basic things about IP so you don't mess up next time around. Um, also, they do some talks within the framework of education for founders to be, uh, mainly from outside experts. So they, they have a good network, as I said, of experts. Uh, and mentors outside the university as well, so IP lawyers, for example, or people from industry that have used patents before from the university. So they bring them in and inside the framework of uh, an established class in physics or in uh, the engineering department, they have guest lectures on, on IP. And the Spark Award, as I said, um, and they don't, they don't do active scouting for technologies for potential patents, uh, so they don't have constant contact with the researchers. Of course, again, through the discussions we had there, they, they all said that it would be good to have. It's something that everybody wants, to be in constant, in constant contact with the researchers, because at the end of the day, it's people with people. So you build trust, researchers know you, they trust you their, with their baby, with their idea, and their research results. So it's good to have this contact uh, with them. It's not always easy. Uh, they don't actually actively seek for it, but it's a noble cause. So if you can do it, it's a good idea to do it. Again, some, uh, some statistics. They have around 100 patents in 2015 and around 50 uh, license agreements. So I, I believe they are doing well. Um, these are some of the products that have their technology inside in various fields from, from apps to sports to bio to high tech uh, lenses um, and the Spark Award uh, I, I found it very very interesting we don't have something similar at the University of Cyprus that's why I, I took note of it uh, uh, they don't give any amounts I and mean, they don't give any money out but it's a prestigious award for the university so they encourage inventions and think more about sparking ideas. Uh, it's an annual event. They have certain criteria, originality, patent strength, commercial potential. Um, they have an internal uh, jury, pre-jury filters, and uh, they also have external members uh, as juries. Uh, as I said, no money is involved, just fame and honor, but it's uh, enough to create you know, uh, interest in the research community and they always come forward, they have this big event, the rector is there, people from the government is there, they have lots of press, press on the, on the event, 
So it's something very um, uh, prestigious, interesting, successful, I would say, uh, for them. They also have a nice award. Uh, these are some of the of the winners of the last uh, four or five years ago. So we had a new approach for treating type two diabetes uh, on electronics, on uh, other devices, screening platform to identify T cell, so bio bio science stuff. So we have different uh, approaches, different uh, winners each year. Another good idea, I think, to take back to your universities if you don't have a similar thing. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the discussion uh, went on to, uh, we took a lot of time discussing on education, how important it is and how uh, we exchange ideas on how to go about it in educating, as I said, researchers and uh, academics, postdocs, everybody in the university students as well on, on IP. Uh, the goals, of course, are awareness, modesty in terms of, you know, researchers are in, are in love with their ideas and they want to pattern them, they want to go and do a spin-off maybe and do a licensing agreement and so on. But if you are more educated on what IP is, then you are also more modest about the possibilities of your, of your uh, result, let's say. Or even in some cases, Patenting is not the, you know, the, the best way to go about it. Maybe it's not a good idea to patent. You can still you know, try and commercialize, but maybe not through a patent. So uh, as many as you know on, on the topic, uh, it makes you also more modest. Uh, of course, everybody faces constraints. Even they, with so many people in the technology transfer office, they still have 20,000 students. They have 500 professors. Uh, the diversity of the, of the group, so they're, they're trying to educate both BSc students up to professors. So you have a big range of uh, people you're trying to educate on, uh, on IP. Uh, the curricula is a matter of uh, mentality as well. There is this mentality that students at the university should learn about maths, not about IP. So it's difficult to include that in all. Uh, educational programs and uh, what doesn't work when you try to educate people is that you don't try to reach everybody and also you don't impose you make it more uh, whoever wants to be educated <coughs> on IP and you also don't evangelize in terms of there is not the absolute truth so empirical evidence is a little mixed sometimes so sometimes uh, it's good to go with a patent, sometimes it doesn't work. So you don't evangelize so, something like, like you, you possess the absolute truth and you're trying to convince people that it's good to go through the technology transfer process. Because it might not work and then you don't want it to you know, come back to you and haunt you. Right? What does work is the offering of basic IP classes. So. Um, on national, EU, and international IP law. Uh, they focus more on patents and copyrights. It's something more easy for people to comprehend and understand. Uh, of course, use external lecturers. It's easier for, the, for people that particip who participate in lectures like this to you know, trust them. They know what they're talking about. They have done it before. Uh, they are from the industry, so it's good to network with them as well. Um, they also try and offer some specialized and integrated classes. So you have the basics, and then you go directly, let's say, to uh, law and economics of innovation. Or you go to the physics departments, to the PhD students. So you have, you have, you have something general, and then you, you, target, you, you target specific groups in the, in the university. A, a variety of types of, of classes, both normal ones and short modules, maybe. Um, and another trend is the non-traditional educational activities. So uh, education taking place in incubators uh, on one-on-one on -on -one, on -on -one basis, so individual counseling, some uh, project-based and active learning uh, opportunities. So it's another trend on IP education uh, as well. So 
this was my 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 notepad from uh, from Zurich. I hope it will it was helpful for you and gave you some ideas. Uh, I will also send you my my presentation and uh, I urge you, as I said at the beginning, go into the EPO website and find out about the toolbox uh, that they have. And it's available to you as well, and they will also help you. They will, they are very eager to assist anyone that goes to them to developing their technology transfer uh, activities. Mm -hmm.